Good afternoon, and welcome to our live webcast of Open Book, Open Mind Online with Jonathan Alter and Jim Axelrod. They're going to be talking about Jonathan's latest book, His Very Best, Jimmy Carter, A Life. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, Montclair's programming librarian, and here are a few housekeeping details. My colleague Molly is going to show you um, an image of the control panel. There we go. Okay, so whether you're using a phone, a tablet, or a computer, you have the same controls in GoToWebinar. Here's the question mark or chat box, um, which is also your link to me and to Molly, who's my librarian co-host during the webcast. You can use it to get live tech help from Molly, and you'll also use it to send us your questions for the author Q&A at the end. Thanks, Molly. Now I'm going to introduce Jared Miller, who's a member of the board of our foundation. Jared um, is not able to be here visually, but you will hear him speaking. Um, and what he has to say is very important to us. So thank you, Jared. Thanks, Ariel. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. We are so pleased that you're all here for another virtual webcast of Open Book, Open Mind. I want to welcome you on behalf of the foundation. We're a group of your friends and neighbors, and our mission is to raise funds that help make possible many of the free programs and services that make our library so special. On average, the foundation's fundraising supports about 5% of the library's budget, and we're utilized by the library as a source of opportunistic investment. For example, as we progress through the pandemic, the foundation has been tapped to support the significant growth in e-content. For example, we saw an increase in e-content circulation by over 70% during the closure of the library. Separately, it's exciting to see the library open for limited in-person services. In just the past week, the community has already taken advantage of the opening with a 30% increase in checkouts over the week prior. In these unprecedented times, the Montclair Public Library remains a constant, thanks to the caring support of generous donors like you. Unfortunately, given the backdrop, we have seen a 15% decrease in our anticipated revenues, which amounts to over $500,000, and we've needed to cut back on staff by 30%. If you want to continue to see your library flourish and enjoy programs like the one we're about to experience, please consider donating to your library through our website, mplf.org. A gift of any size will have an impact and your support is more needed than ever before. And now, enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Jared. We appreciate more than we can say all that you do for the community and for the library. Um, now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Alter. As many of you know, Jonathan is not only an award-winning author, journalist, radio host, and documentary filmmaker, he's a longtime resident of Montclair. He's also a member of our Open Book, Open Mind Advisory Board and an indispensable booster for the library in general. Um, Jonathan is the author of three New York Times bestsellers, also all about American presidents. You can find the titles on your virtual handouts and they're all available to borrow from the library, and you can order them from our partner, Watch On Booksellers. He's also an MSNBC political analyst and a former senior editor at Newsweek. And we're very proud to, have, to welcome here today to talk about his new book, His Very Best. Thank and you, this Ariel. Full length biography of Jimmy Carter. Welcome. Thanks. So glad to be here. We're glad to have you here. Um, and now I'm very happy to introduce Jonathan's conversation partner today, Jim Axelrod. Jim is the investigative and um, uh, chief investigative and senior national correspondent for CBS News. He reports for CBS This Morning, the CBS Evening News, CBS Sunday Morning, and other CBS News. Uh, broadcasts, and he's the recipient of numerous awards. We're proud to name Jim as another longtime resident of Montclair. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Ariel. And just turning on my webcam and mic is as close as I'm ever going to get to Steve Jobs. 
So <laughs> I'm really happy to have been able to have pulled that pull that off. Yes, I, I'm so, pleased that you were able to master the technology. <laughs> um, just so before Jonathan and Jim start their conversation, for those of you in the audience, I want you to know that you can start submitting your questions to Jonathan as of right now and all the way through the conversation without disturbing anyone. I'll be back to read those questions to Jonathan for the Q&A in about half an hour. And now, this is the moment that you've all been waiting for. John, great to be with you. And let me tell you what a wonderful piece of work this is. Um, I've had two long plane rides that were uh, horrendous experiences. And I was able to just dive into this and you got me through some very uncomfortable uh, time in the air. So it's just an awesome work. And we've got so much to get into. We Camp David in Malays and around hostages and the first American president born in a hospital, all that. But before we go any further, I need to check one thing because I thought I may have been hallucinating. Jimmy Carter, the 39th president of the United States, and Barry Gordy Jr., the cultural <laughs> shaper and founder of Motown, have the same great grandfather? That is correct. Yeah, it's it's a little bit um, obscure, and I didn't. It's funny. A lot of people have have focused on that, and it's in a footnote at the bottom of the page um, because uh, they, to my knowledge, and I should have asked Carter because I interviewed him, you know, more than a dozen times. Uh, to my knowledge, they've never met, and um, you know it's a very uh, distant relationship, even though they have the same great grandfather. And it's a, a result of what I think a lot of people understand that um, you know, in this case, it would have been post Civil War uh, in the you know, like immediate post Reconstruction uh, period. But oftentimes, these you know Southern land, white Southern landowners would. Uh, sleep with their slaves or sharecroppers or what have you. And um, uh, Jimmy Carter's mother's name, maiden name is Gordy, or she, Lillian Gordy. And her grandfather um, had, uh, you know, so Jimmy Carter is only partially related to Barry Gordy because uh, Barry, uh, Barry Gordy's great grandfather and Jimmy Carter's great grandfather had an affair with a, 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 a African American woman, um, it was just a who knew, and I don't remember during the course of his presidency that it was ever really talked about, and you sort of explained it uh, anyway. It was, um, but it gives you some idea of you know what one of the things that fascinated me in researching this book is when you get into the Jim Crow South, and you know I got fascinated by Southwest Georgia very rural, very poor, uh, it, not just poor blacks, but poor whites uh, and uh, in the depression. And this was when Jimmy Carter grew up. He was born in 1924. And, you know, they had no running water, uh, no electricity, no mechanized farm equipment. And, and the sharecropper system on his father's farm was just one step up from slavery. It was basically a feudal system. You make this point that in many ways, he's got this 19th century connection and 20th century and 21st century that is a unique figure in American political life, American life really, for touching all three of those, those time periods. Yeah, this was one of the things that really uh, just fascinated me was the epic quality of this story, not just that he's 96 years old, but that, uh, you know, his his childhood was very much, I mean, he says that it wasn't all that different from when Jesus Christ walked the earth, you know, and in some ways he's right. Uh, they did have, because they were um, well off for the area, they had a car, they had a radio, the only radio in the whole area. And there's a great story about listening to the Joe Lewis Max Schmeling fight where Jimmy's father, who you know was a, a, a major racist, well, not, I shouldn't say major because he wasn't really any different than any of the other white landowners in the area, but he let the uh, 
black tenant farmers and sharecroppers come and listen to the Lewis Schmeling fight on the radio uh, that he put out the window so that they could hear. And then there's a great story that Carter tells of their, when Lewis wins in a knockout, uh, they they quietly say, thank you, know, thank you, Mr. Earl. And they go back to their shacks and then they explode in cheers and they can hear them in the distance. So they did have a radio, they did have a car, but they did not have, and they actually had a telephone, a party line they shared with the other families in the area that you know, could afford a phone. Um, but other than that, it was 19th century. Then the 20th century, obviously, he's connected to all the major movements of the 20th century, not just you know, the aftermath of the civil rights movement, globalizing that with his human rights uh, policy, uh, but the women's movement, he appointed more women to the federal bench than all of his predecessors combined times five, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the US District Court of Appeals. So all the movements of the 20th century, he's president in the 20th century. And then now in the 21st century, what does the Carter Center do? It does conflict resolution, democracy promotion, global health, that's their big thing. He's on the cutting edge of the big issues of the 21st century. So this is a, a great American character with a roller coaster novelistic life who lived effectively in three centuries. And let's not forget climate change and solar panels on the White House roof right, in right. the 70s. He put, yes, he put in 1979, he put solar panels on the White House roof. My book opens there and then I back up. It, at the time, the press yawned. You know, you wouldn't have done a story about it. I didn't do a story about it. Wouldn't have done a story about it if I was covering the news at that point. Uh, it was seen as, you know, just another photo opportunity or something. But it was symbolic of his amazing vision and foresight on, on energy and the environment. And at the end of his time in office, he had been conscious of, I found in his papers, Jim, when he was governor in 1971, mm. when other governors would be playing golf or whatever, he's reading scientific journals and he's reading the journal Nature about this thing they called carbon dioxide pollution that the scientists were talking about. And I see he's underlined like these things in real time in 1971. I find him in these files at the Carter Library. And then, you know, his first thing was they, they didn't know about how big climate change was going to be when he was president. So he was doing conservation, all these fuel, the first fuel economy standards, all these other things first funding for renewable energy to, in order to get us off Arab oil. He wasn't doing it for climate change, but at the end of his presidency, he gets this report from his chief environmental advisor saying there's this problem, here's what we are going to do about it. And um, Carter signs off on the recommendations, then he leaves office. The recommendations were precisely what the Paris Climate Agreement was that we had to cut to two degrees uh, below, uh, uh, the increase to two degrees below um, pre-industrial levels, the rate of increase, which was what they settled on in, in Paris. So, you know, that adds a tragic dimension to that 1980 defeat uh, by Ronald Reagan, because he would have been at least acknowledging and beginning to plan for how to deal with climate change in the early 1980s. All right, so as forward, leaning and looking as he was in certain areas. I really want to circle back to the part of the book that I still try to get my arms around, which is Jimmy Carter's sort of interface with the issues of race over the course of his lifetime, which I know framed up uh, certainly the first half of the book, but it, I felt like it loomed over the, the entire work. In 1971, you write about the inaugural, as he talks about the time of racial discrimination is over. Yet for sort of much of the time leading up to that, as, as you say on, I think it's page 131, apartheid reigned, and it did so without much objection from Carter, whose public silence, while common, spoke volumes. Was he at all reticent to discuss his interface with race and perhaps what he would think of as his evolution regarding race? So this, you know, subject has fascinated me, and I did on your network on CBS on CBS Sunday Morning. Uh, there was a little bit of nepotism because my wife works at the show. Uh, Emily Lazar. Thank but, goodness she does. 
I did a commentary a couple of weeks ago on this subject because I think it's very relevant for our time. So there really was no evolution. He was essentially raised, his father, as I mentioned, basically a white supremacist. His mother took care of black patients for free and was the only person in, you know, for hundreds of miles who said nice things about Abraham Lincoln. And, and he was largely raised by an illiterate black woman farmhand who taught him about nature and faith, which of course is very important to him. So by the time he's in the Navy and first conscious of things at the Naval Academy, he's already a liberal. And there is no record at all of him being racist in any way. So he understands this. And then when he's, uh, his, he's nice to the first black midshipman at the Naval Academy, he's being hazed. But when uh, the governor general of the uh, Bahamas wants to have a party for his submarine crew, he refuses to go because they haven't invited the black crew members. But then what happens is his father dies. He goes home to Plains, Georgia, and he takes up his father's responsibilities. He rescues his father's business and starts to build it. And for 18 years, he ducks. He is largely silent in the 50s and 60s. He, you know, he had some reason to be because, you know, when one of, uh, there was a boycott of an interracial farm, Carter observed the boycott. This other business that did not, that sold that farm, farm supplies, was dynamited. Right. So this was white terrorism in his backyard. And if he stuck his head up very much, you know, he, it, it was a problem. Unfortunately, he didn't just stop with ducking. In the 1970 campaign for governor, he used dog whistles and code words like praising George Wallace, that kind of thing, to win because he carried the rural areas. His opponent was to his left and was going to carry the Atlanta areas that were more liberal. So he he sort of um, he pandered to uh, segregationists to win. Then what happened is super interesting. On his first in his first minute as governor, after he takes the oath in his inaugural address, he says the time for racial discrimination is over. There's a whole story about how that happened that relates to his Jewish Cessna pilot who got him to do it and. It's all very interesting, I think, and in, in, in I deal with in the book with these cinematic characters. But he does this. The whites walk out of his inauguration. The white state senators, they feel betrayed. How can he say the time for racial discrimination is over after what he just did? And the black Georgians who are there are going, he said what? He said what? It blows their mind. Then he's a very liberal governor. He integrates Georgia you know, the Georgia judiciary and the rest of it, he's on the map politically. And then he knows he couldn't run for re-election as governor because he would lose, but he, he wasn't allowed to by the state constitution at that point. But he, he told me he would have lost. And when I asked him about that 1970 race, which was the low point of his whole life, and at a certain point, he said to me very softly, he said, are we done talking about this yet? And I said, yeah. Not quite yet, President Carter. I still have a few more questions about this. But, you know, he he understands. And, and later, in a later interview, I got him to agree that he had been late and that that lateness helped to power what he didn't do in the first half of his life on race, powered the global humanitarian that he became. And so there's an atonement factor here that is psychologically really interesting. And what I was arguing on CBS Sunday morning was that, and, and then after George Floyd, the Carter Center under Carter's issued a statement saying, in my travels around the world, I have learned that silence equals violence. And he was talking in some ways about his own silence. So the message for all of us is better late than never. If we didn't stand up on you know, issues of racial injustice, police brutality until now, we can spend the rest of our time doing so like Jimmy Carter did. This was a this was a man, he's a Georgia state senator, a prominent politician throughout the 60s and never makes it his business to meet Martin Luther King Jr. That is correct. I mean, and then, 
then later, because he was an enormously unpopular figure uh, in his state and in his district, there's a bar outside uh, Plains. Plains is a dry town, but they have a bar a little bit up the road. And uh, the night he was assassinated, the, the owner bought right. around from the whole house. And, so, and Kennedy was assassinated. The teacher uh, in Chip Carter's school, in, in Carter's son's school in, in Plains, seemed happy with it and Chip threw a chair at the teacher. And uh, when, when he was sent home, his parents said, we're not punishing you, you know, we understand. I mean, this is how racist this was. So we, 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 we understand the ugliness of our own time, but it's always useful to see the ugliness of, of earlier times and how people dealt with it. He did become very close to Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., who was instrumental in his being uh, elected president. And uh, gave, gave the invocation at the uh, inauguration, no? Yeah, he gave a uh, Benedict the convention. convention in 1976. Right. And he also bailed him out of trouble in the 76 campaign. Carter made a gaffe. He used the phrase ethnic purity, and it caused a big stink. And uh, Daddy King bailed him out of trouble. And, you know, he has enormous... The, the African-American community was the only constituency that never deserted Jimmy Carter. They were faithful to him all the way through. And, you know, Andrew Young, who blurred the book and has been very helpful to me. Um, and people think, well, Carter got rid of him as UN ambassador. The story is more complicated than that. And Andrew Young is basically one of Jimmy Carter's biggest champions and thinks he is a figure of global importance, which I would agree with. It's a remarkable journey when you think that Lillian Carter was still dropping the N-word. Um, that, that's Jimmy Carter's mother who's still using that word. And in the journey of this guy's life, he ends up being sort of the yardstick for humanitarianism. Do you right. think, that famous quote I kept thinking about, uh, I think it was the president of Emory who said, Jimmy Carter is the only man who used the presidency as a stepping stone. Are you yeah. saying that the fuel for Jimmy Carter's later in life work was in some way attempting to make good or to reconcile some of where he came from in its most sort of hateful and damaging uh, ways, that that's what was fueling his, his need to be such a humanitarian later in his life? I think the the major fuel was his faith, but um, you know it is, the fuel was an admixture of his faith and what he felt he was required by God to do, and and his uh, level of effort in everything that he did, which is why I call it his very best. There's a whole story behind that involving his interview with Admiral Rickover to get into the nuclear Navy, which was the most elite program, the most interesting technological project of the middle part of the 20th century. And after that point, he was all in on everything. So I, I think that the fuel um, for that was partly some sense of making up for what he had done, but I think the faith was extraordinarily important. And then the achievements of the presidency. So when he first envisioned the Carter Center, it was to build a mini Camp David because of what he achieved at Camp David. And he wanted to do that in other areas and build on that achievement. And in that sense, he revolutionized the post-presidency. But Jim, just to your point, um, I think the conventional wisdom on him, the reason, one of the main reasons I wrote the book was I learned pretty early on in, in studying Camp David that this idea, bad president, great ex-president, it's just wrong. Uh, so he was a badly underrated president and a slightly overrated ex-president. And the reason I say the latter is that when you're not president anymore, you don't really have any power. So he's done a great job on eradicating guinea worm disease, made a lot of progress on river blindness in 1994, very important peace initiatives in North Korea and Haiti. 
Uh, he's monitored 115 elections around the world. The Carter Center has done great work on mental health. They've done a fantastic job, but whatever they've achieved is significantly less impactful on the world and the country than what he did as president. So I was trying to excavate that story that was overshadowed by, you know, lust in my heart and killer rabbit attacking his canoe and right. the hostages and, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan and, and Reagan and the Kennedy challenge. All of that is in the book at length. So it's not like I don't have all of those stories, but I wanted to also tell the stories of these other things that really changed the world, like establishing relations, diplomatic relations with China, you know, things that are really big, that had huge impact on the world and that people have forgotten about. John, how does a man who you're describing as being so faith-based in all of his works and the way he walks through life. How does a man who is so deeply uh, faithful also forget to thank his staff and supporters after the 1966 governor's yeah. race and, and is famously uh, described as cold and there's that famous picture in the White House, of course, when W called everybody, all the ex-presidents together and he's sitting up, standing apart. So. I don't know, there seems to be a divide between maybe his his retail interactions and his wholesale interactions with the world. What, what's that about? Well, you know, it's it's very um, multi-layered. Like Brzezinski, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, his national security advisor said he has three smiles. He's got the big, broad one that everybody knows that is at least some of the time just political. Uh, and then he's got the kind of tight smile where he's pissed off and he's giving you the icy blue stare when he's being cold. And then he has a genuine smile when he or somebody else has gotten off a biting line that you wouldn't expect. Like I was shocked to find out that, you know, at one point he said, fuck the Shah, you know, and at another point when actually Emily was with me and when we were in their living room in Plains, and he was talking about the lust in my heart thing. And and he used the word, you know, just because you want to fuck a woman in your heart doesn't mean that's any better than, you know, and you're kind of a little bit startled and you realize there is this very complicated, not always uh, the most sensitive individual underneath. And when I asked his uh, younger son, he has three sons and a daughter, Amy, the one everybody remembers, who's uh, 13 years younger than her, her next oldest brother. And um, when I asked Jeff, his third son, you know, what's the one word you would use to describe your father? And he said, intense. And I think that that is right. So you think of him as this genial guy with the cardigan sweater and everything. It, the layers to this man are so interesting and complicated and trying to peel them back. And so he he definitely was not appreciative enough of staff for a long time. Now I think late in life he sort of understands that he had a, he he took a little too much from Admiral Rickover, who was a real prick. I mean he was one of the most important admirals in American history. Carter thinks he was the greatest engineer who ever lived. He figured out how to attach a nuclear power plant to the back of a submarine and he was brilliant in many ways but he was so cold and so hard on his people and the combination of that and his fraught relationship with his father who was a tough sob also um, and the way that kind of combined with the compassion of his mother who even though she did use the n-word sometimes because of the way she was raised uh you know, was uh, a, entered the Peace Corps when she was in her late 60s and was a very compassionate, big hearted woman who gave him his, his, his you know, interest in global health. Um, so all of these things are combining in him to create yeah. a fascinating guy who kept me fascinated for five years and, and had this novelistic life. So you know, he's a guy, you, you you include these sort of tender passages from his love letters to Rosalind, 
Um, and he's also taking jobs or it's contemplating taking jobs without talking to her, like same guy. And right. it's, how can okay. that exist with one man? That is generational. So his, so one of the really, my favorite things about the whole experience is that Rosalind Carter gave me these love letters that Jimmy sent her from the Navy. And it was not all that easy to get them. They are, without question, the steamiest letters ever published between a president and a first lady. I was going to say tender. I don't think tender really does it. <laughs> tender doesn't do it. So uh, uh, I've been advised not to specify. You have to read the book for that. But um, the, uh, you know, they make John and Abigail Adams look like nothing, right? And they had this, they have, and they've been, they've been married, uh, you know, for 74 years. And they met when Rosalind was one day old because Jimmy's mother delivered Rosalind. So they've known each other for 93 years. And she was his top advisor. She's an enormously formidable woman in every respect. And everybody who came into contact with her, they called her the Steel Magnolia and she loved that. And she was, the, at the time, she was the most powerful first lady who had ever served. And I would argue because of some of Bill and Hillary's issues that to this day, she remains the single most powerful first lady, more powerful than Nancy Reagan, which we can get to. But, but Jimmy was a product of his generation. And in his generation, you know, the, if the guy was going to take a new job, he didn't consult his wife. And this is one of the things that where Carter is, can be very apologetic for things he thinks he got wrong. And a long time ago, he admitted that not consulting Rosalind on leaving the Navy and moving back to Plains was one of the dumbest things he ever did. They had some other fights later in their marriage, but that was a really dumb one. And he learned a lot from that. And after that, he was much more consult uh, to a, almost uh, to a great degree would consult with her. And by the way, she gave him the silent treatment on the drive all the way from Schenectady, New York, back to Plains. And she'd say to their young son, Jack, who was about six years old, uh, Jack, tell your father we need to stop at a rest stop. I mean, she really made him pay. And then she made him pay for a full year after they were back in Plains. She was so upset about having to go to that tiny town after they'd seen the world in the Navy. So yeah. I know we have a bunch of questions from folks who are watching, but I just want to ask one more before we get to some of the questions from the audience. So as I say, this book, I want to make sure everybody sees it, uh, is very best, is awesome. I want to ask you some process questions about, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're not otherwise engaged. Um, the documentary uh, Deadline Artist was just, Terrific about Pete Hamill uh, and Jimmy Breslin. Um, you are commentating, you're podcasting, you're writing. John, there are 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So, how did you do this? When do you do this? When do you do your writing? You had to make a bunch of trips to planes. Let me start out by asking you when did you conceive of this and sort of write a proposal and get, a, get your publisher interested in this? How long was this in the making? Uh, so early 2015, first of all, just on the Jimmy Breslin, Pete Hamill film might interest people. I made that with two friends and colleagues from Montclair, Steve McCarthy and John Block. And you can watch it on HBO. We won an Emmy for best historical documentary. And I wanted to give John and Steve a shout out since this is a Montclair audience. Two of the uh, best. Two of the so, best. So, you know, um, early, uh, 2015, and Jimmy Carter came to a book group that I'm in in New York. Uh, somebody knew his grandson. And when we were reading a book about Camp David, and when I realized this was such a virtuoso performance, the easy shorthand, bad president, great ex-president, there's got to be more to it than that. And I had been an intern in the Carter White House, and then I had gone to work for Kennedy when I was, that was when I was in college, you know. So I had, I knew a fair number of people. and. The biggest stroke of fortune is my editor, the late Alice Mayhew at Simon & Schuster, who died this year. Um, she was Jimmy Carter's editor. 
So she smoothed the way and I got all this access, which is really important. So it's not an authorized biography. He didn't have any veto power over it. And there will be parts of it. Uh, he's actually listening to it now on Audible because he, uh, another Montclair, Don Katz, audible.com, um, because he lost his eyesight uh, fairly recently um, after he had a subdural hematoma. His, Rosalind is reading it. But so I started in the middle of 2015. And I, in terms of process, I wanted to, I interviewed him probably too early the first time, but mm. I need, I was worried he was going to die. And I flew to Minnesota. I interviewed Mondale, Walter Mondale, his vice president, as fast as I could. And then I, I got to Brzezinski and Harold Brown, who is his defense secretary, and uh, several others just before they died. So I knew that I was racing the clock on some of these people. So I prioritized the interviews over the archival work, and then I would go back later and do more archival work. But I ended up doing, uh, I think, about 260 interviews. And I went and built a house with Carter in Memphis, the Carters. So I was on a work site with them and saw him, you know, telling everybody what to do and teaching me how to hammer better. And, and then I went back to Annapolis with him for his 70th uh, reunion at, uh, at the uh, Naval Academy, and um, so I, and then I would, I went to Emory with him when he would teach, and I would ride around with him and have meals with him and try to get as much access to him as I could. But ultimately, that was le like what he said in his 90s was ultimately less valuable than Rosalind's diaries, unpublished diaries, which she gave me, his diaries, which are published. But he also gave me some unpublished parts of those so I could see what was going on in real time. And then I got other people to give me their unpublished diaries and letters. That's the stuff that really works for a historian. Also, oral histories that were done like a year or two later, where all the events are fresh in their mind. So I can go back over the, that, these events with them. And I got plenty of good insights from these interviews. But a lot of it was archival work with recently declassified documents and uh and the real challenge jim is just feeling overwhelmed there are literally millions of documents at the carter library so you have to have a very targeted approach yeah. to what you want to see and why you want to see them and sometimes you misfire like for a while i thought carter was wondering why i was doing i was going to do like a whole chapter on the boycott of the olympics because I know readers care about that a lot. So I'm like deep into these letters from athletes, and you know, and and you know, it ended up being a part of one chapter. Um, so you, you know, and I cut a hundred thousand words out of this. That's 300 pages. I cut out of the book because my publisher didn't even want me to turn anything in uh, until I cut it. It was it was going to be over a thousand pages, and they would not do two volumes. Whenever I run into Robert Caro, he would say, why not two volumes, you know? And I was like, I'm not on the 40 year plan, first of all. <laughs> and I'd like to do two volumes, but my publisher doesn't want it. So I had it. And I think it was better stripping out a lot of stuff, keeping the focus on him, not doing, you know, like Barry Gordy, your first question would be, you know, if I was doing two volumes, I would have done like, I would have brought, I think her name was Annie Mae Johnson, the woman that, the African-American woman who Carter and Gordy's great-grandfather slept with. You know, I would have like had a couple of paragraphs on that, but you know, it didn't relate directly to Jimmy Carter. It was sort of like a fun fact. And I, I stripped a lot of that. I kept a lot of the fun facts if they related to Carter and what kind of person he is. But if they were just a curiosities, I would put them either in footnotes or mention them briefly. Last question before we get to audience questions. We have an audience full of readers, obviously, and some writers. It's curious. Yeah. What time of day do you write? How many hours at a time do you write? How does 700, 600 pages get done? And what could have been over 1,000? <sighs> yeah, it was over 1,000 originally. Um, so I'm not. I'm not that disciplined. I've never been that disciplined of a person. 
I think Carter's discipline kind of inspired me because some people have described him as the most disciplined person who's ever been president. Um, I uh, would, I didn't have any particular time of day. When I started writing, um, I uh, felt that I needed to get uh, a certain amount done every day, but I didn't have a particular, I have a very odd, I'm, I'm a little bit low to share this because I have a very odd approach to writing books, which my last two books before this were both about Obama and the deadlines were much tighter. I was writing 400 page books in 18 months, start to finish, both times, both for The Promise and for The Center Holds. And so I developed this strange technique um, where I would create a, like I take from my research what I thought was interesting. And instead of just taking notes from that, I would write sentences and fragments of paragraphs, sometimes full paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then I would put them all into a database that would be, let's say, my, let's say I envisioned a chapter of 6,000 words. I'd have a database of maybe 12 or 13,000 words. And these would be like sentences and paragraphs. And then all I'd have to do to get to my 6,000 words was cut and paste and just, and not actually stare at a blank piece of paper. Right. I mean, I would stare at a blank piece of paper, blank screen. When I had to do new writing of a, of a section or when I was writing the introduction or th there were times when I did that but if I'm doing the what I think you and I both call rock breaking where I'm like trying to get the narrative down yeah. of Camp David or the hostage rescue or you know something that's a story I can start with a super rough draft where I'm just typing I'm not even writing and then I can shape that into a narrative just by cutting and rearranging and figuring sure. out what is the natural often it's just chronological order that it goes and my editor who is bob woodward's editor doris kearns goodwin's editor my late editor she was kind of really great at keeping you focused on the narrative like you're telling people a story and if you slip out of that too much then she don't no, get back to Carter, get back to the story. And and don't write your introduction and your conclusion until the very end. Otherwise, it'll take you 15 years because you won't know how to start. So just start with the narrative, just get the storytelling down and you can go back and get the thematic material in later on. And turn off your phone so you're not looking at Twitter. That's probably important too. I did not do that, Jim, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, I've remained at Twitter. I was tweeting 20 times a day throughout the whole process. <laughs> I, I understand. I, 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 but, you know, that was an addiction. But what, Car the, you know, this is the real answer to your question. The reason I was able to get it done is because it was a vacation, an escape from Donald Trump. So every time I couldn't stand the toxicity of Trump. So I'll tell you a quick story. I'm in the Carter Library on June 16th, 2015, right at the beginning of my research. And I get uh, a text from MSNBC, Trump's announcing his candidacy, he's coming down, he came down an escalator an hour ago, we need you to get to the studio in Atlanta, do your analysis. So I go there, I do the analysis, and I'd say it's scary, at what everybody knows, he's a demagogue, uh, the right wing never, never ceases to not remind me that I said he wasn't going to win when I <laughs> they have me in my their video of that. You're not alone but, there, Jonathan. Yeah. But so then I go back to the library, right? And and I sit down with the Carter papers and it's like I turn the pages mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like the they're they're wiping away the toxins. And that's what it was like for the next five years. Anytime I wanted and this is what I hear is one of the reasons that people find the book an escape because it, this is a man of his first line of my preface, you know, his integrity, decency, accountability can light our way back to a better place in our politics. And even though he was a political failure, 
the substance of his success and his vision and his and his honesty, his basic honesty, and he ran for president at a very similar time, right after Watergate, promising to restore honesty, and he did. So we can restore honesty in this country. Can All right, we're going to turn we're going to turn it over to Ariel um, for some questions. It's interesting to me, just on my last observation. It's so ironic that Jimmy Carter was the president who actually engaged with Trump longer than any of the other ex-presidents and I, I i found that i found that fascinating too anyway ariel do you want to um hop in yeah i'm sorry um no don't be sorry what a wonderful conversation and as you say it really is a tonic to um think about a man who is defined in the terms that you've defined jimmy carter um as we know this is an excellent season for presidential critiques um, uh, we do have a lot of questions here, as you might um, uh, expect. Um, Sam says, thank you for the chat. I am really enjoying your book. Can you comment on Carter's book, An Hour Before Daylight? So uh, Carter's book, An Hour Before Daylight, which is his, about his early, about his childhood, basically, um, is the best book that he wrote. He's written... 31 books that includes you know um coffee table books about the furniture that he builds and book of poems a book a children's book that his daughter amy illustrated book about fishing basically of all of his books including the ones on faith an hour before daylight is the best and it was a finalist for the pulitzer prize in 1998 and even though i did interviews with people about his childhood and consulted oral histories and he sugarcoated, especially on race, he would sugarcoat things. You know, he'd say somebody was a segregationist when really they were just a virulent white supremacist, you know. So he I, I had a lot of work to do in in checking an hour before daylight, but it's a lyrical book. And if if you want to read anything by Jimmy Carter, I, I would strongly recommend it. Great. Um Here's one from Theodore. Congratulations, Jonathan. In my mind, the tragedy of Jimmy Carter is that he came off as the smartest guy in the room and was hands-on to a fault that he couldn't or wouldn't delegate to the degree that a president needs to. What do you think? So it's a very important and interesting question. And on the smartest guy in the room problem, I would put that in the uh, category of genuine shortcomings. Uh, he often was the smartest guy in the room, but it was politically damaging to him to prove it. And so he would make he would leave legislators feeling bad. You know, they wouldn't have a warm and fuzzy feeling when he had them over because he um, he knew more than they did, and he showed it. But the second question, I think, that he didn't delegate, I think, is a myth. And so what happened was, um, was actually the uh, one of my good friends, and I would say top five journalists in America, James Fallows of The Atlantic. Uh, and he was my boss in the summer of 1978 when he was 28 years old and Jimmy Carter's chief speechwriter. And I was his intern, one of his interns. And Jim left the White House at the end of that year. And in 1979, he wrote a famous article for The Atlantic uh, called The Passionless Presidency. He now acknowledges that there was nothing passionless about Jimmy Carter. And that was a headline somebody else put on his piece. And he's enormously passionate about, about world peace and, and human rights and other things. But in the piece, he tells a story of Carter personally supervising who could use the White House tennis court. And that stuck to Carter. And for all the decades since, everybody said, oh, he couldn't delegate. He was a micromanager. Uh, he actually, A, did not personally supervise the White House tennis courts. Uh, it's, his secretary would forge his initials so it looked like he did. Um, that's the kind of thing that took me a while to track down. Um, and while when he was governor, he often got way too down into the weeds. As president, 
the times when he got into the weeds were enormously productive. So to get the Camp David Accords to bring the most enduring peace treaty since World War II between Israel and Egypt required this obsession with details. To get the Alaska Lands Bill, which doubled the size of the National Park Service and protected 105 million acres uh, and, and helped make him the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt, he was down on his knees with maps of Alaska, going over the maps, knowing better than the senator from Alaska uh, what the details were. And so when Senator Ted Stevens tried to come in and buffalo him and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll sign on to this bill and it'll pass if you draw the map here, here, and here, Carter would say, well, if you draw it here, that doesn't protect the headwaters of this river. If you draw it here, it does this to the caribou, you know, and he, that obsession with detail created that uh, achievement. And, you know, I, I really think the same thing is true of several other things that he got done. And so I do think that that micromanaging thing is, it's not a myth that he micromanaged, but it, it's a myth that it was a bad thing. His bigger problem was he just did not take the politics of any question seriously enough. And he would get annoyed at people who would bring up the political dimensions, unless it was an election year where he would play some politics. But, and so he would constantly do these things that were politically unpopular. And Rosalind would say, can't that wait for a second term? And he would go, no, we're going to do it now. So the, the biggest example of that is ratifying the Panama Canal treaties, which prevented a major war in Central America. 100,000 troops, the Joint Chiefs said, would have to be sent if this didn't get ratified. But it was political poison. Five Democratic senators lost their seats over it in the midterms, in the 1978 midterms. And it was very harmful to Carter as well. Two thirds of the country was against it, and it needed a two thirds vote in the Senate to be approved. So it was a very heavy lift and just one of about 15 examples of things he did that other presidents would not have done because of the politics. So anyway, sorry for that. Mario, could, I, could I hop in with a follow? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, I just, while we're talking about sort of the characteristics and qualities of the man and how that interfaced with his presidency, I was struck just knowing that you've written extensively about President Obama, how they compared, because there was an audacity to both Jimmy Carter, who starts thinking about the presidency in what, 72 or 73, two years into a, his first term as the governor of Georgia, this obscure guy, and yeah. Senator Obama, four years in the Senate, uh, but basically a state legislator before that, thinking about becoming president. Um, can you just compare and contrast the, the quality of audacity that both of these men uh, that's a great point, uh, Jim, and I kind of wish I had um, had a sentence. Maybe I'll get it into the next printing. Um, by the way, um, the uh, uh, second printing and the audio book, um, I'm not sure about the Kindle, I think the Kindle version, they have an interview that I did with Obama about Carter. It's just a couple of paragraphs, but um, I had interviewed George H.W. Bush uh, not long before he died, and uh, Obama, it was too late for the hard uh, hardcover, but um, what he said, it, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but what he said was that he greatly respected how Carter took renewable energy from the, what Obama called the counterculture into the mainstream uh, of American life, and then what he did on human rights, which we haven't talked about, but, you know, was a an enormous, uh, though hypocritical, often hypocritical, hypocritical, but an enormous contribution. To your point, um, they they shared that audacity um, and uh, they believed in themselves and they had this confidence. They were both fantastic retail campaigners. Uh, Carter was brilliant as retail in 1976, but Obama was a much better speaker and communicator. And Carter, as we know, especially in comparison to Reagan, but he really had trouble with a prepared text and Obama was able to master that. Um, they shared a kind of um, cerebral 
disdain for the nitty gritty of politics. And there, um, you know, Carter feels very hurt that Obama didn't reach out more to him when he was president. And I talked about that with Obama and Carter. And I, I remember when Emily and I first went to Plains and we were having dinner and I said, what's your, Obama was still president. I said, what's your relationship like with President Obama? And Carter said curtly, we have none. You know, he he was hurt. And John Kerry reached out to him, but Obama didn't. Obama's version of it is, look, I didn't have time. He didn't reach out to any of them. It was this myth about the ex-president's club. You know, I don't really, I don't didn't really consult very much with any of them. Um, but they shared this kind of disdain. So when Obama would play golf, he would play golf with young aides. He wouldn't play, he hated playing golf with members of Congress. Carter hated spending time with members of Congress. He sold the Sequoia, which was the yacht, which was really dumb of Carter to do because it was a real easy way of getting votes. He got most of his legislation through anyway, but he lost on some really big things because he wasn't a schmoozer. And I have uh, a chapter in one of my Obama books called Missing the Schmooze Gene. And Carter was also missing that schmooze gene. And when he went fishing, he didn't go with members of Congress. He went with like, you know, fishermen who could teach him about how to fly fish better, you know. And in that they, they really they're they actually have a lot more in common than yeah. I think Obama knows. And I think Obama made a mistake not consulting more with Carter, who knew all these world leaders and Obama, he did the same thing to Richard Holbrook. He didn't really care very much about what he could learn from prior administrations. And even though I, you know, my books are quite positive about Obama, I, I think in retrospect, he, he should have spent more time with Jimmy Carter. I mean, who, you know, you've, you've covered so many people. I know they're missing certain chips, as you're saying, but they both had the same chip. Who? Whose mind is it cross after two years? Oh yeah, president, that's the next logical step. Um, um, so, so, what? Audience. I have so many questions here from the audience. Oh, so, okay, I'll just do this one really fast. And by the way, I don't mind going over it. People want to stay longer, make this longer, it's fine with me, I'm not going anywhere. Um, and I'm sorry for being so long-winded. So just on that question, so, you know, um, uh, I think, uh, Obama, uh, once he got to the Senate and he realized, look, these other jokers here are no smarter than I am. And then Harry Reid told him, don't wait, do it now. Ted Kennedy told him, do it now. And uh, so that's why he ran for president. He had the audacity to do that. With Carter, it was uh, a little different. So when he's governor, all of these candidates for 1972 passed through Atlanta. Several of them stay at the governor's mansion. And his reaction to them is, these guys are no smarter than I am. And some of them are dumber than I am. And I actually understand as a governor more of what the president really does in terms of where the rubber meets the road when the programs come down to the state level. And they're there in the Senate, they're just in a debating society. So as a governor, I'm more qualified than they are. And and he was the first governor since FDR who was elected. Now we've had several governors become president, but that's, it was that period in 72 that he compared himself to the other much more famous figures in the Democratic Party. He's not one of these guys who wanted to be president from when he was little. He wanted to go to Annapolis. That was his ambition. He wanted to be in the Navy like his uncle. And, um, and then, you know, when he was in, in Georgia, he wanted to build his business and he got interested in education uh, and, uh, and then ran for the state Senate. So it really wasn't until, I don't think he seriously thought about president until he was around 50. Okay. Um, I have another question here and I have a feeling this is a short answer one. Okay, I'll try is saying the love letters specify specify oh no I, i'm not going to do that you have to buy the book for that and by the way buy the book from margot at watch on booksellers and 
um, you, you know, leave your name, I will personally inscribe it to anybody. But no, I, I can't, I can't risk that. If I tell you uh, what are in the letters, then uh, you might not buy the book. So I'm okay, sorry. Let's put this together, Jim. Hey, uh, <laughs> buy the book. Okay. Um, another one is from Karen. Okay, this is quite. This one is a, a another thread. In the book, did you touch upon Carter's comment about Israel being an apartheid country? Yes, uh, yes. This was um, an important part of the section on his post-presidency. So in 2006, he wrote a book called Palestine, Peace, or Apartheid. And his editor, his agent, everybody begged him not to do that. Uh, the book itself was very... Um, I, you know, traditional two-state solution book. It had some things that people objected to, and I. But the title was, as he acknowledges, it was a mistake. He said he lost some Jewish friends over it. Um, at the time, the word was not used much. His point was not that it had already become a apartheid state, but that if there wasn't peace and justice for the Palestinians, it would become an apartheid state. Since that time, Ehud Barak, who was prime minister of Israel, has, has said exactly the same thing. And now any day in the Knesset, you can hear people saying, if we don't deal with this issue, people on the left in Israel, we're going to have an apartheid state. But for Carter to say it is not the same as for Israelis to say it. And um, I think he regrets doing that. And I think he let his, he let his uh, faith in the Palestinians cloud some of his uh, judgment in the Middle East after he was president. But one of the points I make is that deeds are more important than words. So while Carter has rhetorically been the most critical of Israel, of any American president, in deeds, he did more for the security of the state of Israel than any president with the exception of Harry Truman. And the reason I say that is that when I was a Jewish kid growing up in Chicago, we would hear, oh, Israel is being uh, threatened with being driven into the sea. There were four wars where Israel was had an existential threat of being destroyed. And in each of those wars, the most important army was the Egyptian army. The other Arab armies were weak. Without Egypt, they couldn't drive Israel into the sea. So there hasn't been a shot fire in anger between Israel and Egypt in the last 42 years, well, it's more than that since since the uh, Yom Kippur War, but since Camp David, there's been nothing, no conflict. And this has been, this has allowed Israel to create this, you know, fantastic startup state, you know, uh, which has done amazing things in technology and many other areas that, that even though they have had, you know, wars in Lebanon and shelling and all sorts of problems there. And even though they face a threat from Iran, uh, they they have not faced this threat, this threat from the Egyptian army. It's critically important to understand about the latter part of the 20th century. Okay, thank you. Um, here's one uh, from uh, Rebecca. Many first ladies had strong influences over their husbands. It seems Nancy Reagan may have served a similar role to uh, that of the presidentress Edith Wilson in restricting mm -hmm. access to the president at times. Why did you choose to mention Hillary Clinton? Is it because Rosalind had an influence over his car over Carter's policies yes. like Hillary had with Clinton? Would you elaborate? I think it's actually Rosalind, right? Rosalind's influence on Carter. Yeah, so that's why I mentioned Hillary Clinton. So if you go back to Edith Wilson, she controlled access to her husband, who actually was not quite as impaired as, and he lived for another few years, as myth would have it. She did have a lot of power in terms of controlling access, but she didn't determine policy for the United States. Eleanor mm -hmm. Roosevelt, changed the role of first lady a lot she wrote a daily newspaper column she uh, 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 uh held press conferences she traveled around the world gathering information for her husband 
with Lorena Hickok, which I wrote about in my first book, uh, who was her lover, and they they were very important in keeping FDR informed. But she didn't go on diplomatic missions. She didn't negotiate with foreign leaders. She didn't sit in on cabinet meetings. That was, that's, was Rosalind Carter, was the first person who actually had a policy role. She went on an important diplomatic mission to Latin America. And uh, at one point, um, Hugh Seide, uh, who was critical of Carter in many ways, wrote a column in Time Magazine where he, he said, when Carter has an important meeting, he tells his secretary, bring in Rosalind Tsai, that's Cyrus Vance, Secretary of State's big national security advisor, Ham, Hamilton Jordan, chief of staff. And Hugh said, he said, note the order. And they also started the uh, tradition of having a, a working lunch. Uh, he also started that tradition with Walter Mondale because he, Rev, Carter revolutionized the role of both the first lady and the vice president, first person to give the vice president any power, the first president. And so Rosalind had this policy portfolio and her mental health bill, uh, which was passed and signed, but then essentially defunded by Reagan. And then a lot of her ideas were incorporated under Obama, but she was a, a visionary on mental health, extraordinarily important on those issues, on uh, caregivers. Uh, she and uh, the wife of Senator Dale Bumpers, Betty Bumpers, they were the first to inoculate school children, get states to require they be inoculated before they entered school. So many accomplishments. Uh, Hillary Clinton, by comparison, she did Hillary Care, but it failed. It didn't actually go through. And she did not have, although she and Bill have very close policy relationship, she did not have the same kind of, as we know, personal relationship where they were really, you know, to this day, just connected in a way that I think is unprecedented uh, between a president and first lady. So I could I could have written a whole other book just on Rosalind Carter, and I hope she get she's had people write about her, but she deserves a proper biography in her own right. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is from Gail. She says, I assume the hostage crisis is addressed heavily in the book, but I would be interested in getting your take on this, his process of handling that crisis. What were the large, uh, what were the large feeders and whether he feels he made dramatic errors his own, in his own dis, decision making? How does he reflect on Reagan's actions versus his own? Um, so just briefly what happened with the hostages is uh, um, the uh, Rockefellers and, and other friends of the Shahs uh, wanted to get the deposed Shah of Iran into the United States uh, because he had been such a close ally. And Carter, no, 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 he was worried that the Ayatollah and his people would seize uh, the embassy um, because that had happened right after the Iranian revolution in February of 1979. Carter did not handle the Iranian revolution very well. He could have been more imaginative in the way he bolstered the interim regime. It's not his fault, as a lot of right wingers would argue. I mean, these are major, it was as big as the Russian revolution. I mean, this was a major turning point in history. And there's no way that he could have forced the Shah of Iran to fire on his own people. Anyway, he won't, won't let him in at one point, says, fuck the Shah. Then when the Shah falls ill in Mexico, they pull the wool over the Rockefeller people. And I have a whole pretty original story about this in the book. They pull the wool over Carter's eyes and convince him that Mexican hospitals can't treat the Shah and that he needs to be let in on humanitarian grounds. So he lets the Shah in, which, which, and he's treated at New York Hospital, which was arguably the single worst mistake of his presidency because 10 days later, these student militants storm the US embassy and take our hostages. 
Carter does not regret not attacking Iran. He is focused on the fact that he got all 52 of them home safely. But in the process of doing that, he obviously looked weak because it was as if Carter was being held hostage as well as the hostages. And that contributed in a very significant way to his losing uh, his reelection campaign in 1980. It was also a bad economy, which was largely a result of Carter's efforts to try to end inflation. So he points this guy, Paul Volcker, as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Volcker jacks up interest rates to 19%. Can you imagine running for reelection when interest rates are between 15 and 19%? And Carter loses. And then what happens? The harsh medicine works and, and inflation is eliminated. And Reagan benefits. And then he gets reelected. So Volcker, I interviewed Volcker shortly before he died, both elected and reelected Ronald Reagan. Similar deal with the hostages. The Iranians who called, you know, the United States the great Satan and were mad at Carter, they didn't want to give him the satisfaction of returning the hostages when he was president. So they waited until just a minute after Reagan uh, took the oath of office on January 20th, 1981. Then the planes took off. There's a longer story connected with that, but Carter was okay with that. It, it you know, was humiliating to him on one level, but it, he was very, very happy because it achieved his objective, which was to bring them home safely. And that is what Carter was about and is about, is saving lives. And that's why he prior, prioritizes peacekeeping above anything else, and why he meets with thugs, and he's trying to keep the bullets from flying. And he did that in Iran. And Carter at 96 doesn't have any sense of, I was not treated fairly in terms of popular perception, um, that there's no bitterness towards the Iranians, nothing at 96? Well, I think he's been, so after he left office, you know, he was depressed and and did certain things to deal with that, as he was when he lost for governor in 1966 and had his born again experience. And he went door to door as a missionary, which in 1968, which I found fascinating. But Rosalind said, I have bitterness for the two of us, right? So she was super bitter and to this day, is super bitter. And I think that Carter has prayed to not be bitter. And I think he is so focused on what he's doing now and how much he's enjoyed his years after leaving office that he's he's at peace. He's, I found him largely at peace with what happened during his presidency. I mean, he acknowledges, you know, that as Jody Powell said, his press secretary, you know, not only did we not get a honeymoon, we didn't get a one night stand with the press. <laughs> and because on the day after he took office, he pardoned the draft dodgers, right? This was an enormously controversial thing to do. And so right off the bat, even though he went to 75% popularity in his first year, people forget this. Trump has never broken 50%. Um, he, you know, he was doing things and making decisions and messing up in certain ways <clears throat> that hurt his popularity. Um, I think that he try has tried to let <clears throat> a lot of it go, but um, there are certain uh, people he won't forgive, like John Anderson, you know, for running and and siphoning off. He thought siphoning off a lot of liberal voters. Um, uh, and he was pretty annoyed at the Washington Post. And, but for that, I was more interested in his reaction in real time, in his diary, his complaints, you know, the day it happened than what, it, what he was thinking years later. Um, so. um, well, following this kind of follows, this question kind of follows up on what you were saying. So Rebecca says that 
Within the last hour, CNN ran this headline. The last pre president facing re-election trouble like Donald Trump's was Jimmy Carter in 1980. Injured by recession and impotent against the national crisis, Carter lost big. So well, he, got, uh, he, got, he got more votes than George H.W. Bush did in 1992. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, George H.W. Bush lost by a pretty hefty margin to Bill Clinton and Ross Perot got 19%. George H.W. Bush got, I think it was 37, 38%. Uh, and um, so, but the contrast between Carter and Reagan is why people remember this. And there are some real similarities. And Trump is in a position that is similar to Carter at that time. Carter was swamped by external events in 1980. And Trump is now being swamped by events. And he uh, is facing an aging challenger. I mean, Reagan was 68. He was 10 years younger than, than Biden, but he seemed pretty old at the time. And the threshold that Reagan had to get over in the debates and that Biden had to get over in the debates was the same. They just had to not drool, right? And then it was like, okay, he's not he didn't drool. And that's why I think Biden's going to win. You know, he the bar was set pretty low. And that's what happened in 1980. They only had one debate and Reagan did pretty well. And he got up this line, there you go again. And and then at the end, he said, are you better off than you were four years ago? And Carter made the mistake of saying that he was talking to Amy about nuclear proliferation. And uh, the the other thing that I didn't realize until I started researching the book is that the 1980 election was on the one year anniversary of the seizure of the hostages. So Jim's network and NBC and ABC and the news magazines, they all had big stories, first anniversary and pictures of blindfolded hostages. And it reminded everybody that he hadn't been able to get the hostages out. Was that because of a deal between the Reaganites and the Iranians? I explore that a little bit in the book. It hasn't been nailed down, but there were some suspicious things that happened. They call that the October surprise. Um, and so he did kind of get swamped by events. I don't think we're going to see a Biden landslide on the level of Reagan's landslide, because what happened was Carter had the South was moving through the 1970s from the Democratic column to the Republican column. But then in 1976, when Carter is nominated the first time he it's such a thing of pride for the south they hadn't had a candidate since 1848 southern candidate unless you include lbj you know but from the deep south that the south went for carter but then in 1980 when the evangelicals deserted carter even though he was a an evangelical himself uh, but there was this fusion between evangelical christians and conservatives who were in ascendancy at that point. So the whole South, except for Georgia, went against Carter. And then he lost New York. I mean, there were, there were states that are competitive, that are not competitive now that were then. Now, if Texas goes for Biden, then you could see a, a Reagan style landslide. So the possibility is there and it is close in Texas right now. So this could be a kind of a realigning election in the for the progressives the way uh, 1980 was for conservatives. Um, beyond that, though, at one point, even though, as Jim noted, Carter likes to maintain relationships with thugs, with everybody, right? Because it's easy to make peace with your friends, it's enemies. So he kept the lines open to Trump for a really long time. And I was really puzzled. I was, trying to get him to attack Trump, you know? And all he would say was, well, he lies too much. And I finally realized it was because Carter wanted to go to North Korea on one last mission. And he knew the family, he wanted to go there. And once Trump started doing that, then Carter gave up on him. And at one point I asked him, hey, do you have anything, right? by email I asked him, do you have anything in common at all with Donald Trump? And he would always answer my email questions Within an hour after I said, I go out for a walk, I'd come back and I've answered all my questions. And this time it was a one word answer, no. And I think that is 
basically accurate because Jimmy Carter is the un-Trump uh, right down the line in terms of accountability. When Trump says to get an A plus on everything, when Dan Rather asked Jimmy Carter, he gave himself some B minuses and C pluses in 60 minutes. You know, so accountability, honesty, integrity, uh, you know, attention to the job, vision, everything. He's on Trump. Uh, and, and so that's why the comparison with 1980 doesn't really do it for me, just because these two men have so little in common. Since we are winding down, can I just ask you as a sort of shrewd observer, do you think this election will last much beyond election day? I, I, I just, you know, I've been trying to monitor it really closely. I think there's um, the latest numbers coming out of Florida is that after a fast start for the Democrats, there are a lot of Republicans there voting. It's basically Trump's home state at this point. Uh, and so I, my gut is telling me that Trump is going to carry Florida, which would mean that it, it's going to be a longer evening. If Biden carries Florida, it's over early on election night. And all the talk about you know, challenges and the courts and all that stuff goes out the window. He's, he's done. But if, if Trump carries Florida and then there are long counts in Pennsylvania, and some other states, and if Trump carries North Carolina and, and Georgia, then, you know, then you have a long count in Pennsylvania, then it really could stretch out a, a while. Because if he, even if he gets Arizona, if Biden gets Arizona, <clears throat> it's 270, 270 under one count. And, and uh, you know, Trump's certainly not going to give up then. So really the determination of whether this is over early is if, if, in Georgia or Florida or North Carolina, if if Biden wins, then then it's okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, so we have. I'm gonna. This is the the last question that we're gonna have time for, and it's a good one. It's from Adrian. Did you have the opportunity to speak with any Black residents of Plains about their experiences with the Carters on their family farmland and in town? If so, what were the impressions of Jimmy Carter and his family? Uh, this is a great question. Um, so I want to distinguish between the black residents of Plains I met when I was in Plains, who almost a person adore Jimmy Carter. Not true of the white residents of that area, who even now would like tell me, I like Billy, but I don't have any use for his brother. You know, they'd say stuff like that to me, the whites, but the black residents of Plains love him. Uh, I did, I was able, I was very interested in what his father's sharecroppers thought of him. And for that, I had to rely on the reporting of my fantastic black colleague at Newsweek, Vern Smith from 1976, when some of them were still alive. And, um, they uh, told him that Earl Carter was mean like just the rest of them, which helped me to get a more realistic view because, you know, Carter obviously would sugarcoat it, even though he said some pretty critical things about his father, like realizing that he went off to have an affair at one point with a farmer's widow. Um, on race, he sugarcoated a lot of it. So some of that got peeled back for me by my, my colleague, Vern Smith. Um, I was able to find a man in his 90s who had been a, a, a one of Carter's black playmates when he was a kid. And he, of course, had very positive things to say about Carter. And then I did these amazing interviews with his, uh, particularly his this one, the first black state senator since Reconstruction, uh, and he um, died not long after I interviewed him, and uh, his name was Leroy Johnson, and he was a very important figure in the history of Georgia state politics. He integrated the Georgia state capitol, and so I, my interviews with him about Carter were really interesting, and then I also talked to his senior 
black advisor, the, a woman who uh, was the both the highest ranking woman and the highest ranking African American in the history of the Georgia state government. And she's the one who first suggested that he put up Martin Luther King's portrait in the Georgia state capitol, which was a very big deal when, when he did that. And, and Daddy King came to Coretta and they, Daddy King cried. He had never been invited to the capitol before. And, and so there's a rich story here. And of course, Andy Young blurbs the book and I did an event with him, which you can see, I think, at my website at the uh, LBJ, at the uh, Texas Book Fair a few weeks ago. And Andy is a huge admirer of uh, Jimmy Carter. Of course, Andrew Young was Martin Luther King's closest confidant, you know, and his at his side through through everything during during the movement. And then he became Carter's ambassador to the UN um, and involved in his human rights policy, which, by the way, was championed by a woman, Patricia Darian, who should not be lost to history because, as uh, a number of historians have noted, a thousand years from now, or at least a hundred years from now, Jimmy Carter's presidency will be remembered because he was the first person, first president to make it a policy of his government to assess how other countries were treating their own people. This had never been done before. And the human rights policy accelerated the end of the Cold War. A lot of people who were against it at the time, later admitted Republicans, later admitted how important it was. Vaslav Havel talked about how important it was. And it basically changed leadership across Latin America as they moved from authoritarian regimes to democracies, and now there's a little bit of a return to authoritarianism in our country and you know several others in Brazil and other places, but there are still twice as many democracies in the world today as there were when Jimmy Carter was president, and his human rights policy was not the only cause of that, but it was a very important driver of that change. Well, that's a, a very heartening uh, comment to end on. And um, I want to thank everybody. Um, thank you both so much for coming to Open Book, Open Mind. And thank you to the audience, because without you, we don't have anything. Um, and I just want to remind you that the book is available through the library, as are Jonathan's other books. But as Jonathan pointed out, we also want to encourage you to consider buying the book, supporting Jonathan, supporting the book, supporting our authors um, at with our partner, local independent bookseller, Watch on Booksellers. Um, and we hope that you'll join us for our next event um, on Sunday, November 15th, which is also at 4 p.m. And Jonathan will be there too, but this time he'll be the interviewer for prize-winning journalists Peter Baker and Susan Glasser about their New York Times bestseller, The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Um, we'll send details about that event to all of today's attendees. Be well, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, Bye -bye. Jim.